at some point we need to figure out how Sam Presti does it. Like, <laughs> yeah. so, so he got a pick to get the, to take on the Horford contract, and then he got a pick to get off of the Horford <laughs> contract. The Celtics and Thunder made a trade on Friday, Mort. Uh, basically traded unwanted contract for unwanted contract was yes. the, the centerpieces of this. So Kemba Walker, along with the 16th overall pick and a 2025 second round pick going to OKC for Al Horford, Moses Brown, and a 2023 second rounder. Uh, Mort, my, my first reaction was just to laugh because <laughs> I... I just thought it was very funny that two years after the Celtics did not want to sign Al Horford to that contract, they are now bringing Al Horford back on that contract. But what was your take of it from the Boston side of things? Well, I, honestly, I was just glad they did it because I've been very vocal on this podcast just in terms of uh, that they needed to get out of Kemba. Like, I, yeah. I think that knee is problematic. There was $73 million left on that contract. I could definitely see a scenario wherein he would come back next year and be significantly worse and significantly less productive because mm -hmm. of that knee and because of like the age. He's no spring chicken either. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think it was a good idea to get out of that thing. Now, do I think that Al Horford is someone who's gonna come in and like fill a major need? No, I don't. And I realize that Boston fans do, which good on you guys. I don't think he's I don't think he's that guy anymore. Like he, he, he can be a nice complimentary piece. He's not going to be worth his contract, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just wonder what the hell the plan is there because they got Moses Brown. They have Robert Williams. Like I, I would just like to figure out who are they betting on here? What's the play? And finally, like at some point, we need to figure out how Sam Presti does it. Like <laughs> yeah. so, so he got a pick to get the, to take on the Horford contract, and then he got a pick to get off of the Horford <laughs> contract. It that's just that's amazing to me. And regardless of what you know anyone thinks about having this type of process of rebuild, this is a guy who understands how to maximize assets. Like he yeah. just that that's just a non-starter. I, I, I'm really fearful in some ways that we're going to see a complete thunder ownage for the next 12 years with all their draft picks. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll get to the thunder momentarily, but it is like a, the opposite of like Russian nesting dolls where they're just <laughs> taking worse and worse contracts and they're getting picks for each one. So like I'm, I'm excited who they trade Kemba Walker for next year God. to get a pick. I, I feel yeah. like it's probably going to be John Wall or Russell Westbrook. Oh, Westbrook back to OKC. <laughs> yeah. And then get another pick to actually yeah. get him after they got like four picks to, to <laughs> wow. Right? It, it feels like it's destiny at this point. It really does. My God. That like yeah. why we really should talk at some point about just giving Presti like executives of the year award. Now I know people are gonna say, well, we don't know what the draft picks are gonna turn into. I really don't care. Like what he's right. done here is just so impressive. Like just in terms of optimizing, you know, the, that asset base and, and just giving yourself so many bites at the apple. Like I think that warrants consideration. Well, I wrote a piece at Forbes the other day about, I, I had written this thing like weeks ago at this point, I was planning on dropping it after the draft lottery and then I had to rework half of it because the stupid trade came four days before. But I, the, the Thunder are pulling off the process, but better. And I got in a yes. lot of trouble on Sixers Twitter for saying that. But to be fair, the Thunder also started from a better place. They started their rebuild having traded away Paul George and gotten way more for him than they should have. They, right. you know, they, they traded away Russell Westbrook. Then this past year, Dennis Schroeder, um, Stephen Adams. Then they started trading some of the guys they got. You know, Danny Green went to Philly for Horford. So yeah, like this is the template. And they have SGA. Right, exactly. Yeah. So they have they already have a star. They have a ton of cap flexibility. And they're they're nailing a lot of these moves on the margins as well. Like mm -hmm. take a Moses Brown, for instance, whom they signed to a two-way deal. They signed him to a four-year deal in March that's like less than two million dollars a year. He ends up starting, I think, 32 games for them, averaging yep. around 10 points, 10 rebounds a game. Then he's included as a sweetener in this Horford deal. 
And all of a sudden it's like, well, we still have, you know, Lou Dort is signed to an incredible contract. We have uh, Kendrick Williams signed for two more years yeah. as well. They have a number of, you know, like the Poku and Darius Baisley, uh, Ty Jerome. They have all these guys on cheap contracts for at least the next two or three years. Theo Maladon. Uh, they have the rights to Micic, who just won EuroLeague MVP. And now they have, you know, probably still 40 million in cap space this summer. So they could either get, you know, throw it off or she at a John Collins or a Jared Allen, someone like that. They could use some of that cap space to take on more bad contracts and take more picks. Like the odds of them hitting, they're not going to do what they did in the late 2000s, where they got back to back to back MVPs in KD, Russell Westbrook and James Harden. But I think the Sixers this year and the, over, the, over really the past five years have proved that you can mess up a lot if you just have the resources to do so. You can still be okay despite messing up a lot. Like yeah. the Sixers are the number one seed right now and are one game away from the Eastern Conference Finals despite tripping over their own dicks for the last five years. The Thunder have way more ammunition than the Sixers ever did. So like you, I, like I'm all aboard the Thunder. I mean, we talked, you know, we did the the future power rankings a month or so ago, and I had the Thunder at the top of my list because I they aren't guaranteed to hit on all these picks, but they have so much flexibility that right. there's almost no way they screw it up so badly that they're like the Orlando Magic. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And the only reason I didn't have the number one was because I prioritized, you know, known commodities at that point yeah. in time. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I I think we're looking at a situation right now that is almost unprecedented. Like people are, I, I did it my, myself. Just said like the process 2.0, like the, the yeah. whole process moniker. This is like the process on steroids, though. This is something yeah. else. This is this is very very aggressive, and I just hope that the NBA doesn't suddenly force them to hire a collegial. It's only fair. They really should. Yeah, just but, the one. Yeah. Or just just don't fire Sam Presti halfway through. That's my best right. advice to OKC. <laughs> just tolerate this next, like, even if you lose more this next year, it's okay. Things will get better. But I mean, we'll see what happens in the draft lottery Tuesday. Houston could fall out of the top four. And then all of a sudden, OKC could have, I mean, if like the lottery breaks perfectly for them, they could have two top five picks. Plus number yep. 16 from Boston. And... If that ends up occurring, they could trade up potentially for another top five pick. And, and if, get like Kate Cunningham, Evan Mobley, and SGA. I mean, yeah, like if they, I, well, three, right? So yeah. they could have they could have two already without trading up. Right? Oh, I see, I see, yeah, yeah. So they could have three, yeah. like maybe it's it's Kate, it's Evan Mobley, Jalen Green. I don't know. Jalen yeah. sucks instead. My my point is, this is a really strong draft at the at the very top of it. Like Cade, obviously, superstar future. Evan Mobley, to me, in my eyes, projects as a proper unicorn. I, I already have him several levels above, like someone like Kristaps Porzingis, for example. I think higher of him than I do Jaron Jackson Jr. I, I I think he's going to be one of those cornerstone bigs uh, moving forward for the next fifteen years. And then there's Jalen Suggs. Like if you cash in a lot of your chips and you get like three blue chip guys like that in a strong draft, then you're right, Brian. Then they won't draft an MVP in consecutive years, but they'll draft potentially three <laughs> all-stars in the same year. Right. <laughs> I, I, I see it. Well, my point is more along the lines of this. I think it'd be a good idea to identify a certain draft. Maybe that isn't, this isn't the one maybe, I don't know. But I, I mm. think it is just smart to identify a certain draft where you go okay this is the one to have multiple picks this is the yeah. one to actually just have like four or five high up because there's it's just loaded maybe this is the year maybe it's next year maybe it's the year after i don't know but i wouldn't be shocked if it's this year because this year it's good it is really good at the very top yeah, we'll, we'll have more Thunder talk, I'm sure, after the lottery in particular. Because, like, worst case scenario, I think they fall to eight. They still have 16 and they get 18 from Miami. So they're still going to have three first round picks either way. So they still will have flexibility to move up right. if they want. Oh, um, I'm, but I'm just, I was saying three at the very top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I mean, I hope they, I hope things break well for them. Um, How would but, Twitter react if they ended up with 
the top three picks. Like just may, got one and three. No, wait, they can't get they three, can't, right? Yeah. No, yeah, they Houston, can't get three. Houston has yeah, to yeah. fall to five. Yeah, to that's true. That pick to get yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. top five. Yep. Good reminder. Uh, but from Boston's perspective, as much as I made fun of this trade on Twitter, I actually, mm. I don't hate it for them. I, no. you know, like I understand Horford, Ho- Horford is like, he's fine. He's going to be mm-hmm. better than he was in Philly. He was, you know, he was passable in OKC. They shut him down because they he was were too good. Right. <laughs> they, they wanted to lose. So that's, that's fair. He's not going to be the Horford of a couple of years ago. I right. like if, if they're envisioning Al Horford coming in as being like the Embiid stopper again, Embiid is going to look at him like lunch food next year. Yeah. It's just not, Embiid's gotten better, Al Horford's gotten worse. It's just not going to be what it was a couple of years ago. But it does, you know, they cleared, I think, almost 10 million in cap space. So it does make it more financially palatable to retain Evan Fournier. In restricted free, or sorry, unrestricted free agency, right? Um, and like you, I I feel like this is just the first in the number of moves, and I'm waiting to see the other shoe drop to see do they, you know, I'm guessing they're going to try to get out of Tristan Thompson. They don't really have any need for him. Oh yeah, what is I don't think there's any doubt there. Yeah, <laughs> right. What does this mean for Robert Williams, who's now up for an extension? Because you have Horford signed for this year, he's got 14.5 million next year guaranteed already. You just brought in Moses Brown, who's under contract for three more years. You know, do you envision Robert Williams as your starting center moving forward? Are you willing to commit the amount of money that it will take to sign him to an extension? Maybe it, it, this gives them flexibility. Maybe they don't have to sign him to an extension, see how this year plays out. Maybe he doesn't play as much, drives down his price a little bit. They let him hit restricted free agency next summer and go from there. Um, one thing I did find strange, this is from Adam Himmelsbach of the Boston Globe. He, he reported, some things I'm hearing in the aftermath of the Kemba deal. C's now feel better about their chances of re-signing Fournier, which makes sense. This doesn't necessarily mean Tristan Thompson's time in Boston is over, which does not make sense. Moses Brown was mostly added as a salary match, but we'll get a look. What am I missing there? Because Moses um, Brown is good. Yeah, a whole lot. I mean, I or you're not missing anything. I, whatever you're missing, I'm missing too. Apparently, okay. Because I, I, I don't look at it that way whatsoever. Uh, if you prioritize Tristan Thompson over Moses Brown, then you're off to a pretty rough start. If you're Brad Stevens as GM, like yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that whatsoever. Um, and Moses Brown, like he had a. 9.8 and a half rebounds per game average in I think 21 minutes per game. Yeah. And he's 21 years old. He'll get a look. You no, know, that he's he'll get more than just a look. Are you insane? Like of course he will. Defensively, he's not there. Like he is still raw, obviously. I mean he played for OKC, so it wasn't a winning franchise. But he'll get more than a look. I'm absolutely sure of it. He, he, he fits somewhat on the timeline of Jalen and Jason. He definitely fits that timeline a lot better than Tristan Thompson does. That's for sure. So like you, I don't, I, I won't take that too seriously. Honestly, I just wouldn't. I, I, it's not, he's not a throw in by any stretch. Right. Like it would piss me off if they considered him a throw in. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, wait, this guy's actually good. Like they just fell right. ass backwards into Moses Brown. Because having him on that contract in particular is going to be such an asset for a Celtics team that has Jason Tatum signed to a max, Jalen Brown signed to a near max, Al Horford taking up a lot of cap space this year. Evan Fournier is probably going to get at least 15 to 20 million per year moving forward. Marcus Smart, you have to worry about him next year. Robert Williams, like they are in, you know, they are capped out unless they completely like clear the decks of Horford, Smart. Robert Williams, Fournier, not for more and more year. Then they can have cap space in 2022, but then they have a very barren roster afterward. Either way, you know, like Moses Brown is a major asset to that team. For a team that signed Tristan Thompson using the full non-taxpayer mid-level last year, which was a huge mistake. Like, who would you rather have? Tristan Thompson at nine million a year, or Moses Brown at two. Yeah, isn't they- that? They traded six. They basically drafted Moses Brown with 16. Yeah. And honestly, given their track record in the draft as of late, 
Moses Brown's probably going to be better than whoever they would have gotten at 16. Known commodity. I think that was the thing. Like they, they whiffed on at least a few draft picks here and there. So for them to know, okay, here's a guy who by 21 was averaging roughly nine and nine. You know what? We, we know there's a certain baseline there. So yeah. if we trade that 16th pick and we get him back, we know that there is going to be production. We know that he's not going to be a Romeo Langford or someone like Grant Williams or Simi Ojale, who's just kind of there, right? I mean, so no, I, I would be, I would be floored. Let me put it this way: I'd be absolutely floored if they didn't use Moses and if they just decided, oh yeah, he's like a thir- third big, like he's fine. Like if that's their approach, then something went wrong, horribly so. Yeah, yeah. 